Good evening. I'd like to call to order this meeting of the Board of Education. Uh, the Board of Education has been in closed session uh, tonight beginning at 645 for the purpose of approval of closed session minutes from April 27th and May 11th, 2010, employment of employee, actual potential litigation. In addition, we also had discussion on, close, uh, on collective bargaining, which was not on the agenda. Um, uh, but we had discussion on that topic. Uh, there are no action items coming out of closed session. Please stand and join us for the Pledge of Allegiance. Mrs. Walsh, can you please call the roll? Ms. Hirsch? Here. Mrs. Davey? Present. Mrs. Sostachik? Present. Mr. Collins? Here. Mrs. Droney? Here. Ms. Conroy is absent. And Mr. Kalkwitz? Here. Thank you. We have six board members present. One is absent. Um, I have the uh, speaker list uh, for. We do still have Okay. I, um, I'm just going to mention I have the speaker list up here for public comment. We don't have anybody who's signed up to, to address, so um, we will move on from that point. Um, but our next item on our agenda is uh, student recognition. We have four different groups of students um, that we'll be recognizing tonight covering um, different aspects of uh, what we offer here at District 205. Uh, Dr. Krizik, can you give an introduction, please? I can. Um, we have a, um, four diverse um, groups of students that we are recognizing this evening. Um, one of our students, uh, Caleb Straits, is not able to be here this evening, um, but what is significant about his recognition is at the um, State Gymnastics Championship. He was, he placed first in the all around and he tied for first in the parallel bars. Not only is it significant that he placed first, but he is only the third all-around state champion in New York history, joining only two other of his uh, former classmates, which was Ron Nasty in 1983 and Christian Carmona in 2007. So if we could just give um, Caleb in abstention a round of applause for that. Significant <laughs> Under Wendy Albert's leadership over the past few years, um, when we get to this point of the year, when we recognize the Family, Career, and Community Leaders of America, the FCCLA competition, the number of students who achieve um, recognition and awards has continued to grow. It speaks to the cohesiveness of the um, FCS department and um, Wendy Albert's leadership. And I'd like to now turn it over to Wendy to uh, introduce the students and help us understand their significant accomplishments. Good evening. My name is Wendy Albert. I would like to thank the school board and Dr. Krizik for recognizing the accomplishments of our FCCLA students tonight. I would also like to thank the FCCLA advisors, Rachel Kania, Sabrina Ibrahim, Ashley Miller, Ashley Egley, and Lindsay Weatherford, as well as the parents and families who have helped the students prepare for the various competitions throughout the year. If I could have all of the FCCLA students join me up front here. All right, while they assemble up front, I'll give you a little bit of background about FCCLA. FCCLA stands for Family, Career, and Community Leaders of America. It is the nation's second largest student leadership organization with over 220,000 active members and 7,000 chapters across the United States. And York participates um, with about uh, 60 active members across six different chapters. Students are enrolled in family and consumer science classes and have the opportunity to participate in FCCLA. Through this organization, students develop leadership and life skills necessary for home and the workplace. 
At York, FCCLA students are involved in a variety of leadership conferences, competitions, and community service projects throughout the school year. This year, our students competed at the regional and state levels, and they competed in several different types of events. Proficiency events are events that have a category at the regional level and then can move on to the state level. And then STAR events are events that can go an additional step and go on to the national level. Student medals are awarded based on their overall score for the project that they have created. And in a, a most outstanding distinction is awarded to the students with the highest score and the best competition project. The students before you have all competed at the regional level and received scores that allowed them to advance to the state level. They're being recognized tonight for their accomplishments at the state level competition that was held in Springfield, Illinois this past April. In the area of culinary arts, we have, again, two different categories. We have proficiency events in the area of pastry arts, cookie decorating, salad design and display, relish tray display, and entrepreneurship, either catering or catering. Uh, cake decorating competitions. In the entrepreneurship cake decorating, students design a cake around client specifications, cost out and plan the production and delivery of the cake, and then at the actual competition, they are decorating the cake in front of the judges. Receiving gold medals in cake decorating were Melissa Cozy, Brittany Biggs, Marcy Monaco, and receiving a silver medal, Kate Lawrence. In relish tray design and display, students design and create a fruit or vegetable platter, and Riley Lorig received a silver medal for his fruit platter design. The Culinary Arts Star event is a competition that goes on to the national level, and I liken this event a little bit to Iron Chef. The students are given a menu, and they're in groups of three, and they have to cook and plate their food in under an hour, and they're judged on everything from safety and sanitation to knife skills to um, the actual taste and presentation of the food. After the state level competition, the students, um, the top six students are chosen to participate in an intensive training program down at Kendall College. And the top three students then from uh, that group are selected to move on and be the Illinois uh, Culinary Arts team. Unfortunately, he could not be here with us tonight, but I do want to recognize Alex Tandu, who received a silver medal and was chosen to be a member of the Illinois team. He'll be um, participating and competing at nationals this July in Chicago, Illinois. So let's give Alex a round of applause. <laughs> to introduce our next group of students, I would like to introduce Rachel Kenia. Hi, my name is Rachel Canyon. I'm the advisor for the Child Development Chapter. Um, in this area, students participated in either lesson storytelling or lesson planning. Um, for the lesson plan event, students plan an age-appropriate lesson plan for children between the ages of three to five years old um, that include various curriculum areas. This year, the given theme was Down on the Farm, which they presented to a panel of judges. For the storytelling event, students picked a children's book of their choice and retold that story using various props and teaching aids. Um, I'd like to congratulate the following students on their achievement in these two areas. For storytelling, Rita Wirth received gold medal and most outstanding distinction for her storytelling presentation. And also in this event, the following students received gold medals. Laurel Miner and Abby Huster. Um, in preschool lesson planning, Jackie Han received a gold medal for her lesson. And now I'd like to introduce Sabrina Ibrahim <laughs> for fashion and interior design. Good evening. My name is Sabrina Ibrahim. Um, in the clothing and fashion areas, um, students competed in the sportswear, semi-formal, casual dress, two-piece, and lined garment categories. Students constructed garments inside and outside of school time. The judges graded them on everything from fabric choice and overall appearance to construction details and fit of the garment. The following students received medals in apparel construction. Darren Buckley and Nicole Carey received gold medals. Receiving silver medals were Samira Jagardar and Anastasia Gliadis. <laughs> 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 
Last but not least are our interior design students. Students created interior design boards to meet a specific client specification each year. Um, Amanda Bolin received a gold medal. Congratulations to all of our competitors for their hard work and dedication to FCCLA this year. Thank you. Good evening. Um, on behalf of the Board of Education, I would like to congratulate all of you. Um, I know that this competition had more than 1,900 students and advisors, so what you have accomplished in your individual areas is, is very impressive. Um, and I know all of that is still balanced while you're um, still trying to keep up um, your work here at York, and we're getting close to finals, so I know it's a busy year. And we, we appreciate the de dedication you put into extending yourself beyond just what's involved in the classroom education and the success that you bring back to our district. Um, and with that, I would like to read a proclamation because the Family C Career and Community Leaders of America, the FCCLA, and State Competition Award Program is acknowledged throughout the nation as a prestigious student recognition program in family and consumer science related education and because this program encourages excellence on the part of individual students and encourages them to pursue careers requiring specific skills because the following students at your community high school earn top spots in the state competition. Cake decorating gold, Brittany Biggs, Amanda Budnick, Melissa Cozy, Cody Glover, most outstanding, Stephanie Medina, Marcy Monaco, Rachel O'Brien. In silver, Kate Lawrence, Alex Tandu, who also qualified for Nationals training team. In clothing constructions, gold, Darren Buckley, Nicole Carey. In silver, Anastasia Gilatis, Samira Jagadair, Olivia Murphy, Arely Robles, in interior design gold, Amanda Bulin, Katie Knopf. In silver, Jenny Egert, who also qualified for nationals. And in bronze, Dana Donofrio. And in preschool storytelling gold, Nicole Barton, Michelle Dembski, Abby Huster, Laurel Miner, Sarah Samuel, Kim Smega, Stephanie Spears, Chrissy O'Connor, Connor, and Rita Wirth, who was also most outstanding and in silver, Zoya Mohammed, Christine Yum, and in preschool lessons, gold, Jackie Hand, Nicole Mordini, and Nicole Shaw, and in relish tray, silver to Riley Luring. Because these accomplishments bring pride and prestige to your community high school, to District 205, and to the community, now therefore be it resolved that the Board of Education and Administration of Elmhurst Community School District 205 express congratulations to these students for their outstanding achievement. Congratulations. Thank you. In keeping with tonight's theme of continuing to raise the bar, last year at this time we recognized eight students for their achievement in the Junior Achievement Titan competition, a national um, uh, business simulation competition. Tonight we have 12 students that we are recognizing um, under the combined leadership of Jim Burrell and Rich Rosenberg. So I'd like to um, turn this portion of the meeting over to them to share with us the ex success of, uh, of this program and these students. 
Thank you, Dr. Krizik. <clears throat> uh, my name is Jim Burrell. I'm a business teacher at York High School, and I'm honored to be surrounded by our two junior achievement uh, sponsors. Don Jackson is from UPS, and Rich Rosenberg is from Elmhurst Camera, and they come in weekly. The, the Titan is just kind of the icing on the cake, but the hard work is done during the whole semester. Uh, when these two gentlemen, and Carrie Leiden as well, comes from uh, UPS. They actually help our kids go through this online business simulation called Titan. Um, I, let me explain a little bit about Titan, and I'll call our kids up, <clears throat> and we'll recognize them. <coughs> Excuse me. Titan is online business simulation where teams of students compete against one another to attain the highest retained earnings. Each company is selling a fictitious product called a hollow generator, which kind of resembles an iPod. The students make business decisions based on price, capital investment, marketing, research and development, charitable giving. Decisions are then evaluated by the computer program with the company with the highest sales uh, and retained earnings is awarded points. And your goal is to try to get as many points as possible, and then the computer program ranks uh, the, the different companies one through eight. Um, this year we had, in fact, why don't I call our kids up here real quick. Uh, in fact, guys, if you could come up and kind of uh, stand, stand as the other group did, I appreciate that. We just had some great kids this year. In fact, we went to the Chicago Titan competition with 10 other teams, and uh, it really wasn't a contest. We were um, very, very dominant, both in the morning rounds and the afternoon rounds. And, uh, you know, these kids just worked hard. You know, once we do the preparing from the junior achievement side uh, and as teachers, but once they're in there with the computer program, they're co totally on their own. And the nice thing, it's not that they actually make decisions um, based on what's happening at the time. So it's, uh, I know, uh, Don, I know you mentioned UPS uses this as well uh, for their management team, and, and it, it's, uh, you know, it's a nice program that allows the kids at, at the high school level to uh, make business decisions and, decisions and actually see uh, the results and get ranked. So um, without any further ado, let's recognize the kids. Uh, did you guys want to? No. No? <laughs> We're good? Thank you. Okay. By the way, it could not have happened without these two. It's, uh, they're just, it, th this is the one day that we competed, but again, the whole semester is, is the key, and, and uh, they're just incredible help. I just appreciate it. And, and you know, the business partnerships, too, we you know, try to stress that, and it's, it's nice that, uh, that they donate their time. Uh, so let's get on to the awards here. <clears throat> uh, York teams, uh, by the way, this competition we've, I, I don't know if, don't mean to brag here, but we've won the competition five of the last six years, and it's kind of interesting. The first year we won, uh, Marco's brother Nick was uh, was on that championship team, and and <laughs> Nick is here tonight too. Um, but uh, now, so Marco's keeping on the, the uh, family tradition, which is great. Uh, let's go with our, our first. Well, let's go with the third place team, and then we'll kind of mo move up from there. It really, at the end, when you look at our points, we were only separated by what about six points with a couple of quarters to go. And the next closest group was about 200 points behind us. So as far as I'm concerned, they're all winners. Uh, but at the end, the computer does decide who, who won and, and who came in third. So let's go to third place team here. Uh, third place team was uh, Mike DiBernardis. So Mike is in attendance today. Uh, Joe Berg, uh, Eddie O'Connor, and Zach Starr. So they finished third. Uh, they were winning with a couple of business quarters to go, and then they, uh, something happened where they lowered their price, they went through all their inventory, and uh, things didn't turn out as, as planned. Uh, <laughs> it's fun. It, trust me, it's, it's a great time. So uh, let's go with our set. So that was our third place group, so congratulations, Mike. Um, Let's go with our, our, our second place group here was uh, Brad Bosworth, uh, Joe Ross, Adam Hilgenkamp, which is, who is here tonight, and John Worley. And again, with about one quarter to go, uh, it kind of came down to when you were going to lower your price because no one knows when the quarters are going to end, and uh, these guys were in first place for a very long period of time and, uh, and then seemed to get passed at the end. So congratulations, fellas. Good job. <laughs> And then uh, right down, came down to the last, last one, but our winning group today, and there were some prizes. Um, uh, Junior Achievement donated a $100 gift certificate to Office Depot to all four of the winners. 
Uh, RJ Klein hands, Maddie DeMaio, Andrew Geib, and Marco Maximovich. And we have three of our four champions here. So if you guys could step forward here, I appreciate that. You know, all of our all of our kids in in the program are just uh, learning skills that they're going to take well beyond uh, York High School, and we're just very proud of all of them. So, uh, congratulations, everyone, and thanks again for recognizing or giving us the chance to be recognized. Sorry, can I ask you all I'll just to stay up here for a couple minutes? Um, you'll see one of the themes that's consistent with all the groups we're recognizing tonight is um, taking what you're learning and able to extend yourself outside of the classroom, being able to make decisions, and really leadership um, falls into, it's an important part of um, the varying roles. Um, the prior one was more about you know, being a community member, being a wage earner. Um, this is more about corporate leadership, being able to make good business decisions, and if you have any tips in the real world, um, those of us that have seen our um, 401ks go down a little bit would like to hear from you. But um, all joking aside, um, we think what you've accomplished is really tremendous. And on behalf of the district, um, we'd like to extend our congratulations. And with that, I'd like to read a proclamation. Um, because the Junior Achievement Titan Competition is a nationally recognized business simulation for high school students in business education. And because this program encourages excellence on the part of individual students by encouraging them to run a virtual manufacturing company, master five key business decisions, price of product, production levels, marketing expenses, research and development costs, and capital investment to earn the largest amount in retained earnings. And because students of your community high school, Maddie DeMaio, Andrew Guy, R.J. Klein, Hans, Marco, Max, Maximovic, placed first, Brad Bosworth, Adam Hilgenkamp, Joe Ross, and John Morley placed second, and Joe Berg, Mike DeBernardis, sorry, uh, Eddie O'Connor, and Zach Starr placed third. And because these accomplishments bring pride and prestige to your community high school, to District 205, and to our community, now, therefore, be it resolved that the Board of Education and Administration of Elmhurst Community School District 205 express congratulations to these students and their accomplishments. Congratulations. I don't know why in recognizing these next group of students, I thought of you, Mr. Collins, thinking that you might want to get to know these students um, since uh, they were involved in the stock market um, game and uh, were successful in this process. So um, I'd like to now turn this over, this recognition to John Billerman, who's going to talk about the success of three of our students um, in this, uh, this competition. Mr. Billerman. Thank you, Dr. Krinsick, Board of Education. Thank you for this honor this evening. Um, I, uh, I'm a business teacher at York High School, and I teach in the Intro to Business class there. And um, one of the things that we enjoy doing and have done for quite a while is participate in the Illinois stock market game. And this is a game that is played by, uh, this year, 17,000 students in the state of Illinois from various schools all over the state. Um, uh, students form stock market groups, uh, investment groups. Uh, they make decisions based upon what we hope in our hearts is some of what we teach them during the course. Um, and I think uh, with the group that um, we're honoring tonight that finished second in the uh, state of Illinois in the stock market game, um, I think uh, some of the things that we stress during the investment section of our teaching or our, our course were taken to heart by them and put into practice and uh, they reaped some, some real nice benefits from that and that was very nice to show. Um, three students that are involved in the stock market second place finishers 
um, I don't believe are here tonight, but they are Matt Richardson, uh, David Sal Getty, and also uh, Dennis Rowley. And uh, they would, uh, yes, come on up. Uh, Dennis, I didn't see you. I'm sorry. <laughs> so we have one to represent. Thank you. Thank you. Um, back in February of this year, they formed a stock market uh, investment group, and uh, this was done on their own. They chose who they wanted to be in a group of three. We decided that would be a kind of an optimum group for them to make decisions in. And um, they used uh, some of the background that we taught them uh, in, the, in, in the investment chapter uh, to help them invest. Uh, I stress diversification, which I think they took that to heart, and um, allocation of portfolio. And uh, if you don't spend it, it won't earn anything for you, so let's use it and invest it. And uh, they had $100,000 to invest. Um, during the eight-week program, uh, their ending value of their portfolio was $136,300. Uh, $300 short of the first place team in the state of Illinois. So they did a very nice job with that. Um, uh, I'm going to kind of turn it over to Dennis, and uh, maybe you can tell us a few of your secrets that you <laughs> used. Um, how did your um, group kind of decide on what to invest? Can you kind of elaborate a little bit on that? Not a lot, but a little bit. Oh, come on up, please. I'm sorry. Hi. Um, at first, we didn't really go into the competition uh, as competitively at first, you know, knowing the amount of students that Mr. Billerman said, uh, 17,000. But um, with our stocks that we bought, one, two of our biggest gainers were Netflix and Huntington Bank Share, which is uh, just an American bank outside of uh, Ohio. And, you know, we would check our portfolio portfolio weekly and you know as we saw um, that our gains were rising you know we uh, just kept with it more and more and like I said you know Netflix did really good for us in Huntington Bank so we were pretty happy with the results you know it was kind of uh, kind of agonizing at the end knowing that we only came short uh, by a couple hundred dollars but it was pretty fun so thanks Thank you, and uh, uh, good investing, I guess, huh? Good job. <laughs> Very good. Dennis, Dennis Diggs, Thank you. Um, some of the students that we recognize tonight actually uh, are graduates. They graduated last Sunday, um, so they are moving on to whatever the next place is. Um, but from some of the recognitions that we've done, um, I feel pretty confident that they're going to do great. They're well prepared and excited to see a lot of the students um, will be back here, hopefully bringing more success next year. Um, I know this the, the stock market game, you know, it's not... Uh, it, it's more than a game. When, it, when I went to the website and tried to understand really what's involved, um, it, it occurs over time, so you really have to watch it and monitor it. Um, it requires crit critical thinking, decision-making, uh, cooperation. You all have to come get on the same page as far as what you're going to do and um, what decisions are good ones. And uh, when you don't agree, how will you reconcile that? Um, and also there's a lot of research and investing concepts that you have to do. So, again, um, kind of a common theme, th th this accomplishment goes well beyond just what you're doing in the classroom and your homework. It's something that you're pushing beyond um, really what uh, other students are doing. So um, we would like to congratulate you representing your team um, for your accomplishments. And with that, I'd like to read a proclamation. Because the stock market game, an online education program, teaches students about the world of investments over a number of weeks during the school year, and because this program requires teams to conduct extensive research and make sound investment decisions as a team, and because the introduction to business class team members, Matt Richardson, Dennis Rowley, and David Salvaggi, placed second out of the 17,000 other students who participated in the state of Illinois, increasing their original virtual portfolio of 100,000 to 136,000 over just several weeks. So again, you know, if you guys are looking for uh, clients, 
Um, I've got some, some money that could be redirected. And because this accomplishment brings pride and prestige to your community high school, to District 205, and to our community, now therefore be it resolved that the Board of Education and Administration of El Elmhurst Community School District 205 express congratulations to these students for their outstanding accomplishment. Congratulations. <laughs> always invite the students and their families to stay for the rest of the meeting, um, but if you choose not to, I know finals are coming up, uh, we'll take a few minutes break and allow those who want to exit to do so now. We are going to uh, move forward on our agenda. Again, as I noted earlier, we have no public comments. Uh, just a reminder, anybody who would like to address the board, um, we have a sign-up sheet that's available outside up until the start of the board meeting. Um, you're welcome to come and speak and address the board um, at the beginning of any board meeting. Um, our next item on our agenda is superintendent's communication. And we're going to have a discussion of the 2010-2011 budget revenue. Dr. Krizik. I'm going to turn this portion of the meeting over to Ms. Masterton, but we're doing something a little bit different this year. Rather than give you both the, the entire budget all in one meeting, um, we're breaking it up. And we're going to give you the tentative uh, revenue projections for the 2010-2011 year. And at the June meeting, Ms. Masterton will share with you the expenditures, at which point in time we'll be able to see the relationship between the revenues and the expenditures. Um, there was a PowerPoint presentation that was posted on Monday, some few little changes to that we got some good news uh, the federal government had actually made a mistake with uh, our federal idea dollars by the, by about four hundred thousand dollars so we were depressed for about a week um, thinking we weren't anticipating that and then got the notification that um, they had had a, a math error um, at the federal government so at this point um, I'm going to turn this over to Ms. Masterton who will um, give you the overview of what we anticipate based on what we know today and it's ever-changing because until the state legislature also passes their budget um, we, we do not know for sure what our final revenue will be for um, next school year did I just take your whole presentation yes. oh. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to get you out early, Ms. Masterton, so. <laughs> there we go. I'm a fast talker anyway, so. But thank you, Dr. Krizik. You did make it a little bit easier for me. I can just skip over that part on there. Um, this is our preliminary revenue um, budget, and as Dr. Krizik said, it's going to change, and it probably will change quite a bit as, as we go through the year. Um, but um, revenue for public schools is normally separated on, into three categories, a local, state, and federal revenue. Um, property taxes, other local revenues such as fees, um, contributions, um, food service revenue is an interest on investments, um, which I ha wish I had that young man who, who, who's working the stock market working for me. Um, they uh, comprise 91% of the budget this year. 91.1, um, which is an increase of 1.4 percent from last year. The state of Illinois is projected um, to provide 5.9 percent of the revenue in places like categorical grants and general state aid. That's actually a decrease of 1.3 percent from 2009-10 budgeted revenues. Um, actual receipts will be significantly lower, we believe, from the budget. Um, at this point, what we've heard from the State Board of Education is a sideline is that our categorical grants, we will receive our fourth payment. They are split into four payments. We will receive our fourth payment from an entirely different fund, most likely from the federal government. But two and three are in limbo right now. And under normal circumstances, the state of Illinois is required to pay their bills within 60 days after the end of the fiscal year. Uh, if they do not, then they um, will actually um, expect that whoever is owed the money will sue them for the money. However, school districts cannot sue the state of Illinois because we are an arm of the state of Illinois. So we're kind of in a catch-22. Currently, we understand that the legislature is trying to, uh, to float legislation that will allow them to wait until December 
to um, pay those revenues. So we'll see how things will go from there. The federal government is now providing the remaining 2.9% in grant allotments. Um, the last American Recovery and Rehabilitation Act, which is ARRA funding, will be received in 2011. Um, total decrease in budgeted revenues, and I know that's the first time that we've been hearing that in a very long time, but the total decrease in budgeted revenues from 0809 budget to 910 is 2.4, almost $2.5 million, or a 2.28% decrease. Um, the state of Illinois has not adopted a budget. Uh, the most, lately what we've been hearing is that uh, among the multiple proposed budgets, that um, the latest one would have $6.9 million um, in expenditures in excess of revenue. Um, if it is adopted, the state will fall farther behind in their payments. That would be the expectation. They owe us, as, as of May 1st, $2.45 million. Federal projections are coming in slowly. As Dr. Krizik said, one was wrong, and we were very happy to hear that we were getting more. Um, the allocations may change before the budget is adopted. And we have not included any TIF dollars right now, uh, mostly because we don't know what's going to be happening. We'll have discussions this summer that may change our assumptions. Um, um, but right now, we're not including an appropriation for TIF dollars. So our local revenue property taxes, and I apologize for how small it is, but when you're working with figures, it's a little hard to make them big when you have this big of figures on there, is um, we're projecting $88.7 uh, 88 million of local revenue. That's an increase of approximately $1.4 million. Um, we currently have 40, almost $46 million deposited. Um, and we're expecting another $44 million on June 1st, June uh, 15th as well. Um, so before the end of the fiscal year, that's our tax dollars in there. Another large source of revenue is corporate personal property replacement taxes. That's a revenue code. And I should delineate that local um, revenue is normally uh, starts with a 1 and a revenue code. So as you're looking at our um, detailed budgets that we also send to you, you're going to see these 1,000s, 1100s, 1200s, 1300s. That delineates that they're local revenue. State revenue begins with a three, and federal revenue begins with a four. So the state revenue is three thousands, and the rev low, uh, federal revenue is four thousands. So the local um, corporate personal property, personal property replacement tax is revenue code twelve hundred, and um, we're expecting one point six million dollars in there. Although I have been hearing rumors that it's actually going to go up this year, so I'm kind of waiting to get those figures. I'm expecting them early next week, so we may actually see more money than what we were budgeted for last year was one point seven. Um, corporate personal property replacement tax is a kind of a weird thing. When the Illinois Constitution was passed, they abolished um, personal property taxes on corporations. And that was back in 76, 75 or 76. Um, immediately, the local taxing bodies were, you know, um, very upset because they lost a large source of income. So uh, in 1979, they passed a new law that said that the state had to provide, had to, it had to levy a tax against corporations. Um, and then it would have to provide um, replacement tax at a 1977 level plus the CPI or, you know, some um, uh, inflator on there. And so that's what's been happening. Any uh, taxing body that was not levying taxes against personal property for corporations does not get corporate personal property taxes. So we obviously were, and we get uh, a sizable sum in there. The rates normally are for corporations, they pay 2.5% tax on income. Partnerships, trusts, and S corporations pay 1.5% on income. And public utilities pay a 0.8% tax on invested capital. So that's just a little quick update on what personal property replacement tax is. Here's the rest of our local revenue. Um, it, you can see tuition is going down. That's the result of the fact that we're not running an elementary um, summer school program this year. And so obviously our tuition costs are going to go, our tuition 
uh, receipts are going to go down, but we're not incurring any costs. So that's that's actually not a bad thing. Interest is very low. Um, as our fund balances fall a little lower, and right now we're seeing very low rates in interest, it's, it is definitely dropped. Um, food service revenue will go up a little bit, um, mostly because of um, we also have the CPI for uh, food service rates that goes up every single year. And we're actually seeing an increase in the use of food service, so that's a good thing. Um, our fees and our textbook rental obviously are going up a little bit. Um, so in total, our, the additional revenue, um, local revenue for tuition, internet interest and fees and ed fund is $3.9 million. And for all the other funds, it's, um, it's a small amount. It's mostly based in interest. And so totally, it's about $4 million for all funds. And then sales and rentals and donations is our next grouping. That's a revenue code of $1,900. Um, uh, budgeted $628,000 this year. We got slightly more than that in donations, in particular for um, the York Field. And so we're, we're actually bringing it down a little bit because they sort of advanced us more than we expected, and so we expect them to be a little bit less this year. We also are losing about $10,000 in sale of computers. As you know, we had a, a fairly good sale last year, but we sold our inventory so we don't have that much to sell this year total local revenue by funds are up there for you to see but the final figure is 95 million plus um, so that's about 1.4 million dollars more it's a 1.56 percent increase from the budgeted um, from 910 now we go to um, a different story, and that is our state revenues, which are revenue codes 3,000 in the education fund. And as you can see, we're projecting for the education fund a drop from almost $7 million to um, just above $4.6 million. Um, and it's kind of all across the board, but it, particularly in special ed, where there ha are some significant reductions in state revenue. And all the other funds, operations, um, we last year put general state aid monies into operations. We're not going to be doing that this year. We're, instead, we're putting it into transportation to bolster the fund because the state has not been sending transportation money and our fund is in jeopardy. And so in order to bolster that fund, we will be adding our general state aid into transportation. So um, grand total on all funds is um, $6,261,468 that we're projecting. That represents a 25% in decrease from last year or slightly more than $2 million. And just for your information, I've sent, uh, put out the federal revenue, uh, revenue codes 4,000 for you to see. As you know, that very wonderful PE grant, PEP grant that we had has now expired. We had three years of some excellent dollars that we put to some great programs in physical education. Um, that has now expired, and that accounts for a fairly sizable loss of $429,000. As um, Dr. Krizik jumped the gun and said, <laughs> we, um, we, are, uh, we did get new figures on um, the IDEA um, special education grant, so we will be receiving, instead of $1,001,000, $1,482,929. On that. And the rest of our federal monies go into the title programs. Um, and conversely, we have, um, we're have we not really sure what our title programs are going to be yet. We really have not received any information yet on it. The only thing we do know is that there's not going to be a Title IV next year, Safe and Drug-Free Schools. They, that's been eliminated. So our grand total is actually... 3,559,888, which is a loss of approximately $480,803, or a 12% decrease. So here's our total revenues by fund. That includes, by the way, a $1.1 million transfer. That's a transfer from the Ed Fund to the Debt Service Fund. 
Um, those, as we remember from last year, we transfer monies that are for leases and for debt certificates from the various funds to the debt service fund now, instead of just for bonded debt. Um, the total is $105,490,564. You'll notice that um, debt service is going down um, slightly. Operations is definitely going down quite a bit. Um, and education, although we took most of our local dollars and put it into education, the losses that we got in grants um, from the state and federal government affect education and to a lesser degree transportation. We did bolster transportation this year because we have not been receiving the money from the state. So although we budgeted for um, uh, revenues in excess of expenditures, we're still almost a million dollars um, less than we have budgeted for. And we don't know when we're gonna be receiving those. Um, capital projects, obviously, we're not um, expecting very much interest at all on anything. Um, working cash, we do have a slight levy on, and life safety, again, small amount of interest. And um, 2009-10 to date is 60806000 and as, again, I, $44 million we expect that, but we're receiving in June from local taxes. And obviously, we'll still get some other revenue as well. So... Um, we will be close to our 910 budget in terms of revenue, um, with the exception of the state budget, which we just don't know what we're going to be getting there. And I'll be happy to take questions. Just curious. What's the process you go through, or, or really, where do your, you get your information to project the state revenue that you expect? Mm -hmm. Well, what we do generally is we get information from, for instance, our legislative um, lobbying unit lend, from ISBE, from um, various different uh, organizations such as IASB, um, Illinois ASBO. Uh, we read the papers. We study their budgets that they're putting out, and we try to use our best guess. And truly, this time it's really truly a guess all the way around. Mrs. Davey. Um, if we are going to assume that um, we're not going to get much more from the state. I mean, we, we got our, our fourth quarter payment, the second and third. Um, I'll, I'll be talking to the board later about my, the uh, lend report because I was just there on Monday morning. And but I will say that one thing that did come up was we should not expect or plan for second and third quarter payments. So um, I think they're just kind of being trying to be realistic with school districts uh, as they're trying to close this year's budget. That there probably isn't going to be much more money coming from the state. What impact will that have? I, I know every year. It's a catch-up game. We, we, we don't get everything we thought we were going to get from the state, but then we usually get it, you know, into the next year. So when you're, your budget year, it's kind of a rolling cycle. You don't get it all, but you know it's going to come. So the next year's budget, you plan for that. I think this year is an extraordinary circumstance because it's not going to be a rolling catch-up, and we're not going to be able to budget an amount that, that we didn't get for the close of, you know, 9-10 as we do our 10-11 our budget. Do you, do you have an idea of how big of an impact the, the, the dollar amount that will be and how it will directly impact us as we're, um, you know, pushing the pencil to close a new budget for 10-11? I do think that we will be in the range of two to two and a half million dollars that will not receive this year from the state, or maybe never. Um, when I did the budget this year for 10-11, uh, I did not include any carryover dollars. I don't believe we're going to get any. Um, and being preferring to be conservative and being happily surprised. I, I wouldn't budget for it, just like I didn't budget for TIF payments, just like I didn't budget for um, until we heard differently, you know, in terms of the federal grants. Um, the one thing that I 
was not going to do, and I'm not really sure. I'm kind of trying to monitor what the fiscal health of, of what's going to happen is because I didn't include any carryover money, I took the straight appropriation that I knew of from the governor's budget for us and applied the percentages to us. I did not include what might not come in 1011. And I am concerned about that. So although I have a budget that says this is what they're telling us we're supposed to get, not including what we didn't get in 910, I did not put in a factor for what we might lose because they don't pay 1011s either. If I could follow up, um, thank you. That that was helpful. And and I guess maybe the best we can hope for is we do get a little bit of something to pay back for this budget. And then if we don't get everything, again, it's it's going to be this rolling catch-up game, perhaps. But as you said, there, that could be a pitfall. Um, my follow-up question is, when, when we sat at this table earlier this year and de determined the amount of cuts that we were going to, to presuppose we needed to make, we didn't, we didn't account for not getting this $2.5 million in state. It, some of it you may have, have factored in, but I, I, you did not factor all of that in. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. So how far behind are we going to be even though we already made two and a half million dollars of painful cuts, just knowing what position the state has put us in. From what I could tell in comparison to our projections that we've done in the PMA model, we're about a million dollars short of that. So, and I am conservative normally in my projections, so, and, and PMA will is not necessarily it, it's based on a different type of criteria and and so i'm going line by line by line and they're just taking general percentages so it might be an even percentage get the same and i i'm kind of dropping that down from there and so right now it looks like possibly about a million dollars less um however as we said, I have heard good things about corporate personal property replacement tax to the point where we might be close to restored to 0708 levels, which was about $1.9 million, so that's really good. Um, we found the additional $400,000 after we had the heart attack over not getting that, and, um, and we're going to hope for the best with the title funds. So. You know, at this point, I haven't included any race to the top funds, although, you know, that wouldn't be very much anyway. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of things that may come about, and I, I'm just not projecting on that. So it's probably going to be about a million dollars short. Well, I will close by saying it's... It, it some of the things you just outlined may come in, but then there are a whole lot of other things that may not come in that make that million even larger as mm -hmm. well. So I think we need to be realists when we're, we're considering it. Thank you. I think what's really unfortunate is the fact that the burden is once again falling on local. Um, local amounts, local taxes, um, you know, to be up to 91.1 percent that the local area, the community has to support um, is very unfortunate. Um, and, and there's not a lot, I guess, we can do about it except hope that, you know, something breaks and something gets better soon with Illinois. This is Deroni. Do you, can you tell us how the tax collections were like last fall and whether or not you expect or what you're hearing about what you think they'll be this coming June? I factored in about a 1% decrease in uh, over a year's time for the tax um, collections, um, just taking into consideration a number of different Issues that are coming up in terms of you know foreclosures and other things like that, but I did factor in about a one percent because the banks are responsible no matter what for um, you know for what's going on and everything. So there's going to be some in arrears, but not a lot, and they are telling us not a lot. So, are you seeing a one percent decrease off of a like ninety six percent collection rate or a hundred percent collection rate? Uh, no, I, I'm 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 basing it on about a ninety seven point five percent collection rate.
Um, okay, I'm going to jump in with a couple questions. My my first is just making sure I understand. On the local property tax mm -hmm. slide, we're at about just under forty six million, and we're saying we're going to get an additional ninety million. Forty four. I'm million. sorry, 40, 44 million. So our total collections will be about ninety million, which looks to be a little bit better than the budget. And I just want to make sure I'm I'm looking I, at at that correctly. So then in 2011, we're, are we being conservative? Is there another piece missing when we're looking at $88.7 million no, we're, in revenue? Uh, the, the tax revenue is somewhat easy enough to, to project because half of the year is at a, at a rate that you already know, which is the 0.1%. The other half is on a CPI rate that you know, which is 2.7. The unknown in there is the growth. Um, that's, that's really when the EAV changes that are going to go on. So being conservative, we're using 2.5 to 2.7 percent for what we're thinking is going to happen next June. Um, and, um, and I think that is fairly conservative. It's probably going to come in about a little over 2.7% um, increase, I think. Okay, but we wouldn't expect it to go down. So the, probably there's a little bit of room in, in there, um, and you, I'm guessing you indexed it off of the budget, which would show the growth. Um, I do just want to make uh, one point um, to Mrs. Davies. You know, our, our concerns not just about the revenue shortfall, but also about the funding levels. And when we looked at our cash flow forecast, we knew we were going to be tight. Um, hopefully not getting into a borrowing situation. Obviously, this you know is something we're going to have to look at pretty closely as we start to look at our expense projections. Um, I, I will say um, we did receive our funds from the city of Elmhurst. Um, Dr. Krizik and I went, so at least local um, governmental agencies are paying their bills on time. Um, so we do appreciate that. Um, but but I, I I guess you know you've already talked about as far as bringing the expenses forward. And, and I think, you know, we, we've said this over the last several months, we need to watch this really closely. Um, we are, we're not seeing a lot of positive surprises here. So um, we're going to have to make some, some decisions, especially um, I would guess that as we look at the next cash flow, we're going to see that we're going to hit the red before we get to the end of the funding year for the next school year, which was not what we had um, planned for when we did our cuts. Um, are there any other board questions or comments? Ms. Hirsch? I just want to make sure I understand the question that you had asked Mrs. Ostrich, because I was, wasn't sure about this as well. The $44,000 that we're expected to receive on June 1st, you're saying that that's higher than we originally anticipated because that's affected, that's the 2.7 CPI? No, that's the one, no. the point one. It's point one. No, the, the budget for 1011 is includes... 2 the one point one, the point one percent, and the two point seven. So the combin it's a combination. The point one percent will be delivered to for the nine for the ten eleven year in September, okay. and then the two point seven will be delivered in June of next year. So that's where you get that one point four one point five percent increase in revenue in local revenue is from the combination of the two of those. Can you help me understand then how we're coming in at, at it's basically looking like $89 million in local. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sorry, I'm looking at slide number five. It's not up on the screen, but we've got 45, almost $46 million collected already to date, and now we're looking to add another $44 million. That adds up to Wait, 89 uh, I'm sorry, it's... It's okay. It's I'm going to bring five. it back to that. Local revenue by fund, no. There you this go. One? That one. So I'm just, you know, our budget was 87 million for local revenues, mm -hmm. and now I'm looking at 89 million. So mm -hmm. I'm just trying to, a little over. So I'm trying to understand where the extra 2. million came from for fiscal year 9 10. Because our original budget was 87 million. And now and we're looking be at our collection as 89. So is right. that the Pat Masterton conservatism coming in that we're actually collecting 2.7 million more yes. than you had projected? Yes. That's a significant dollar amount. Yes. In terms of the collections, you know, budget versus actual. Yes. Um, you know, so I, I guess 
I have asked before, I know, the, the, you know, the buffer that you build in to the budget for us. Mm -hmm. But when dollars are getting tighter and tighter and tighter, it's of concern, so I want to make sure that I fully understand what assumptions are being built in right. to these revenue numbers. When I look at that, I thought I was misunderstanding. I thought it was bumped because it was the 2.7 CPI. So I, I want to better understand. Well, when I, when I did budget, knowing a 0.1% and what they were telling us in terms of, of looking forward, um, in terms of the EAV growth, which was going to be completely negative on there, I left it at a 0.1%. I left it very low in terms of the amount of taxes that we were going to collect in the second half in this June collection um, because I couldn't project that we were going to have any property growth when the assessor's office was telling us we were not going to be having any uh, property growth. But instead, we actually did end up with like a 1.75% increase in there. So that is, is why there was that additional monies. Uh, in there, and conversely, I'm sure that there's additional expenditures um, that were not projected, you know, in terms of that um, to help offset the the extra extra revenue that we have in there. It's just it ends up being that way in terms of trying to work around percentages and dollars when you don't know what's going to be coming in, when you don't know what your collection rate's going to be, et cetera. It all goes in there. But the 44 million. Um, was projected to be about $42.5 million um, in terms of the budget because we had the expectation that the point one would mean that we weren't going to be seeing any new growth whatsoever. And we actually did see a little bit of new growth, so that was a positive for us. So, I mean, I, overall, that's, I appreciate that it's a moving target. It's mm -hmm. very difficult to predict. Uh, it's more, uh, this to me is good news. I mean, this is the number mm -hmm. that you know, comes through. So we're, uh, our revenues for this current year that we're living through right now are higher than we anticipated. And, that, you know, I, I can say pretty positively that although we work really, really hard to keep our um, expenditures down, um, we had more growth this year than we expected as well. And so we hired a few more teachers than we had expected because of the, incre uh, the increases that we received. So you know, it, it, will it end up being a million and a half dollars more? No, I don't think it is a million and a half dollars more. But um, th we did hire two or three more teachers than what we budgeted for because we ran into these growth issues coming in, as we always do in September and October. Um, but this year was a pretty strong year, probably for the same reason economy-wise. People were no longer sending their children to private school, and we were picking up private school students at the um, at a couple of our schools that we hadn't expected to. So, hate to take away the good news, but it's the yin and the yang there, so. Um, you may have said this earlier. Um, can you just uh, confirm again, which, uh, at what meeting do you think we'll come back and start looking at the, the uh, I guess, the first view of where we, we think our expenses Senators. are going to be? June 15th. June 15th. Yeah, we'll begin the preliminary on that. We will um, probably not have all the pieces uh, um, secure at that point. There are some things that we know we probably aren't going to have absolutely positively secure on in terms of salary, but um, we do have a pretty good idea of where we're going, so we will be using the, the figures that we know and moving forward on that. Um, so we will be coming back on the 15th. We're just about loaded up tomorrow. I go to get all of our insurance information as far as property casualty and liability and workers' comp and um, those, and so I think that's about what's left over besides a little tweaking going on. So I expect that I will be able to send it to you, you know, right away on that Wednesday um, before the board meeting. So you can take a look at it. I, I would also recommend that at the point we get to where we've got a little bit firmer whole picture that um, we have a board meeting, uh, workshop meeting so that we have the opportunity to open up questions for the community also. And as I get changes, um, I'll note them in budget requisitions. That's what we call it, where we're putting in the detail. 
So I have 400 and some do um, million dollars, or 400 some thousand, I'm only wishing that I had 400 and some million, 400 some thousand dollars to add to um, the budget. So that'll be shown as an extra line item as a budget requisition, and you'll be able to see it on the reports that you get in there. But I'll also keep a, a running tally of the additions on there. Um, okay, thank you, and, and uh, on behalf uh -oh. of the board, I, I, I think it's important uh, we extend our thanks to you just for making sure that we're continuing to stay informed, that we're making the best decisions that we can, and we have as much time as possible to react to some of the things that are coming down the pipeline, right. so we do appreciate that. Um, we are going to continue on our agenda. We have approval of uh, board meeting minutes for the April 27th, 2010 and May 11th, 2010 meetings. Um, have all board members had the chance to read through? Are there any amendments uh, or corrections to the meetings as presented, uh, minutes as presented? Okay, seeing none, those will be approved as they are presented. Um, our next item on our agenda is our superintendent's consent agenda. Are there any items any board members would like removed from the consent agenda? Mr. Collins? Like item, e, item E. Okay, any other items? Uh, Mr. Carlquist? Item H. Item H. Um, can I have a motion to approve co the consent agenda? I have some item E and H. Mr. Kalkwitz. I move the Board of Education approve the uh, consent agenda uh, as presented this evening exclusive of items E and H. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Mrs. Davey. I'll, um, we actually have roll call is needed. We have bills here. Uh, Mrs. Walsh, can you please call the roll? Mr. Kalkwitz? Aye. Mrs. Davey? Yes. Ms. Conroy is absent. Mrs. Hirsch? Yes. Mr. Collins? Yes. Ms. Ostichik? Yes. Mrs. Sterone? Yes. <clears throat> Six ayes, no nays, one absent. That motion carries. Um, may I have a motion? Uh, Mr. Carlquist? I move the district approve uh, the uh, list of bank depositories okay. as proposed. Second. Um, moved by Ms. Mr. Carlquist, seconded by Mrs. Davey. Is there any board discussion on this item? Um, seeing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Um, item E carries. Um, may I have a motion for item H? Uh, <laughs> Mr. Collins. Po, po, uh, yeah. Call? Okay, um, we're gonna we're gonna do a, a roll call on on that item. Um, Mrs. Walsh, can you please call the roll? Mr. Carlquist? Yes. Mrs. Davey? Yes. Mr. Collins? Yes. Mrs. Deroni? Yes. Ms. Hirsch? Yes. Ms. Astic? Yes. And Mrs. Conroy is absent. Okay, we have five ayes one absent and one present. That motion carries. Um, our next item is item H. May I have a motion, please? Mrs. Davey. I move that the Board of Education approve athletic training services for NovaCare Rehab for the 10-11 school year with an optional second year in the amount of $39,900. Is there a second? Seconded by Mr. Collins. Any board discussion on this item? Mr. Carlquist? A few questions. Uh, first is I'm wondering what amount of money we have in the budget today for this, uh, these services. And, and, and then, uh, so, so first financial questions and then others just in terms of necessity, especially as we talk about revenues and, and, and budget. Here, so I'd rather thirty-five thousand. Thank you. And then, Dr. Krizik, um, in, in terms of de uh, determining what the level of services are that are either desired or required, how do you?
come to that? Uh, how is that determined? In other words, when I when I think about um, the size of the school, having just sat through the the um, athletic. Uh, awards, end of year recognition, the number of students that are participants. Is this a service that, that on one hand is required uh, of the district to have training services, or is this a service we make available to our students? If it's if it's if it's not required, why do we offer it? If it or if it is, uh, and if it isn't required, are we offering? And we choose to. Are we offering enough service? Uh, with the scope of this contract to serve all the needs uh, of the of the students. Do you want me to take that? Um, I can. I I I don't believe that we are required to offer athletic trainer services. Um, we do it uh, as a precautionary measure to ensure that our students, who are student athletes, are are correctly taken care of if there should be an injury or just in general to teach them the proper way to warm up, the proper way to stretch muscles, the proper way to do what they need to do in order to keep fit. Um, and so um, the two trainers that were specified in the RFP, um, the RFP specifications were written by Mr. Rudder uh, with, I assume, um, contributions from his coaching staff uh, there is a provision within there that there will be adequate supervision and trainer services for all of the activities, athletic activities, that um, they need to cover in terms of um, here at York or there at York, um, as well as going to other schools. The um, it was a thoroughly evaluated um, training program. And he was satisfied with, you know, those uh, criteria. Last question is, are, are these service providers or the recommended service provider, are they or do they need to be bonded? Uh, or the, the related question is, are there any um, liabilities, exposures to the school district for providing, in essence, these types of training medical uh, services to, to student athletes? As, um, as part of the bid specifications, they do provide us with liability coverage in the tune of about a million dollars. Um, they're also covered by our liability insurance as well. Um, the, the new training service is um, one that's been used extensively in the college market, and I think we will be one of the first to be used in the high school market. Um, uh, and I think Mr. Rutter feels pretty comfortable with them after talking with them and their qualifications. And then lastly, I noticed that the current provider of the services did not respond to the bid. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. Thank you. Um, I, I do have one additional question on this. Um, this is a one-year contract with an option for a second. What's the process for the, the renewal? And, and just uh, to, to give you the background on my question, you know, as we're looking at what we might have to cut going into the 2011-2012 the school year, I mean, if we're cutting athletics, I, I just want to make sure that this isn't going to be just a natural extension and that the uh, extension of the contract will be something that we'll have the, the uh, ability to have a discussion on. Um, absolutely you will it will come back to the board um, to be approved as a matter of fact uh, and part of the reason that we write a one year contract is number one um, this is a brand new company we want to make sure that the services are such that we're happy with them number two we do are, and are aware of the fact that you know these are not required services and so it is a possibility that we might want to make some changes to them either plus or minus and um, so, yes, we will definitely be bringing it back next year for you to approve. Um, Mrs. Walsh, can you please call the roll? Mrs. Davey. Yes. Mr. Collins? Yes. Mr. Carlquist? Ms. Conroy is absent. Mrs. Deroni? Yes. Ms. Hirsch? No. Mrs. Ostajek? Yes. It's five ayes, one no, one absent. That motion carries.
Um, our next item on our agenda is upcoming meetings. Just a reminder, we have a meeting scheduled for Tuesday, June 15th. Um, it will be a business meeting, 7.30 here at the District 205 Center. And following that, Tuesday, July 20th, um, also a Board of Education business meeting um, here at 7.30. Are there any board communications? Mrs. Davey. I just want to give a brief update from Lend. I probably told you the, the most important thing was what we learned was not to expect more state payments. Um, the, uh, the legislature is just this week going back into session. They um, will be concentrating on the budget. That will be the, the, the probably the, the only and main focus of um, any legislation coming out. Normally when a budget's adopted, there's what's called a, a BIMP bill that's the budget implementation bill that goes in companion with the budget there will not whenever a budget's adopted this year there will not be a normal bimp bill instead you're going to be hearing about an emergency budget act and that is uh, something that they um, used years ago when jim edgar was governor when the the state had some um, financial crises that needed to be dealt with and they plan to uh to to uh, pass legislation or bring forth legislation for this and it gives the governor an incredible amount of power and authority to move things forward in the budget um, and it, it categorizes more things on an emergency basis but within that is what uh, Miss Masterton referenced that it would also be what would extend the amount of time the state has to pay back uh, last year, these last year obligations from the two month period to at least a six month period, probably till next January. So that that's all going to be a part of this emergency budget act. So um, the only difference is that in when this was used in uh, General uh, Governor Edgar's time, education funds were protected from this emergency budget act, and this time around they will not be. It, everything is going to be fair game from all social service agencies. And, and education as well this time. So um, it, it doesn't bode well for us having anyone looking after our interests at the state level because it's, it's pretty much every man for themselves. Um, there, the only other thing I, I think that it was so interesting to me is there, there's a group of female legislators that have formed their own coalition that are looking at everything differently and 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 taking a hard line stand on on some of the the governor's initiatives as well as things coming out of, of the of the Madigan camp, and they are growing in um, growing in power and I think in respect because they have uh, they've taken a, a different. Uh, lens look at, at a few things. So you may start hearing more. And they don't have a name per se, but it is it's just a group of, of, of female legislators that are working towards uh, a, a different approach to some of our financial issues in the state. So stay tuned if, if you, we might hear more about that. Mr. Carlquist. This is our first board meeting since the board issued a press release and there's been some coverage in the newspaper about the, um, the request or proposal from the Board of Education to revisit the teacher's contract next year to have reduced uh, um, increases to the contract. Seeing our, our uh, teacher's union present here this evening, I was reminded of this. and. And uh, you know, I just wanted uh, to, as one board member, uh, add my comments, which is I mean, the board's interest was to preserve teachers' jobs, was to keep as many qualified teachers in the classrooms with students, and also to be responsive to taxpayer uh, interests and our fiduciary responsibility. And while I was disappointed with the, uh, the outcome, the decision, I'm very respectful of the union membership's uh, right to each member cast, cast a vote. Um, but what I wanted to emphasize also is, is to uh, compliment and thank the union leadership for, on one hand, strongly advocating for your membership, but on the other hand, uh, being uh, balanced and, and uh, open to the, uh, the overture from, from the board. So uh, for that, thank you. Okay, um, seeing no other items, I will accept a motion to adjourn. Mm -hmm. Moved by Ms. Hirsch, seconded by Mr. Uh, Carlquist. All in favor? Aye. Aye.
Those opposed? Um, this meeting is adjourned. Uh, thank you very much to all who attended.